Now, this is a story of a man, a dairy farmer, who came back from the dead. Doctors were all set to turn off his life support, but his family refused to give up. They demanded the hospital try high doses of vitamin C. Well, as Melanie Reed will show you, it turned into a fight. The specialists didn't believe such a treatment would work, but, well, suffice to say, the farmer is no longer on death's door, and his family claim he's living proof. This is Aotearohonga farmer Alan Smith in Auckland's intensive care unit shortly before the doctors told his family his life support should be turned off and he be allowed to die. And I just sort of backed up and looked at him laying there so helpless and you know he was my whole life we've been together since we were both 16. On the Smith's Aotearohonga farm Alan's wife Sonia and son Shane remember when they were told it was all over. I was, you know, speechless. And then it was like, your dad's the sort of person that you can always rely on him to be there to help you. And it was like, shit. Childhood sweethearts Sonia and Alan were married when they were both 17. They have three sons. Their ninth grandchild was on the way when Alan got a severe case of swine flu. He was always there to help us with anything. Um, and it's just, yeah, I mean, what, we, what were we going to do? And he wasn't yeah. very old, eh? No, only at 56. But on the other side of the house, over the back paddock, having been taken on an aerial check out of the farm, the bloke they're calling the Miracle Man. Looking anything but dead. Alan. Hello. <laughs> You're not doing too bad for a guy that was meant to be six foot under. Well, apparently I was supposed to be turned off. Many years, about over a year ago now it was. Yes. We're going to turn the machine off that was keeping you alive? They were going to turn the machine off and... Alan Smith's survival has been described as one of the most remarkable and controversial turnarounds in New Zealand medical history. Feel lucky to be alive? I am very lucky. They tell me I'm not a one in a million, I'm one in a billion to live. Alan's story began on June 28, 2009. He arrived at Auckland International Airport after a fishing trip with mates in Fiji. He caught a connecting flight to Tauranga where his launch is moored and was joined by his wife Sonia. I woke up in the night and he was really hot so I um, gave him some Panadol and that cooled him off but cooled him off a bit much because later on he was so... I woke up again and he was just like, he was laying there just stone cold and just laying there still as and I thought, oh God, the first thing that came to my mind was, God, he's dead. In Tauranga Hospital, Alan was swabbed for swine flu. After two days, his deterioration was so dramatic, the three sons and eight grandchildren arrived. Warned this could be a final goodbye. Just seeing him just um, in, in an induced coma and everything like that just was horrible. I mean, yet that was, that was the beginning. A specialist crew flew in from Auckland with a portable ECMO machine, a complex life support system which takes over the function of the lungs. All the grandkids had surrounded their popper before he was airlifted north. No, still alive. My popper, they said. Oh, then what happened? Um, they stood waving at him. They lined the corridor. Oh, when he was taken out. When he was taken out the stretcher, yeah. Then they waved goodbye to the helicopter. Yeah. From the hospital. Yeah, from the hospital as they took him away. And you must have been thinking, the chances aren't good. Yeah, well, yeah, it was, it was then I was starting to think, well, you know, where are we going to go with this? As Alan lay in a coma in Auckland Hospital, heavily medicated, ECMO and other machines keeping him alive, Sonia began a detailed diary. 
Saturday, 4th of July. Told this morning that it's 100% swine flu with no other bacteria. He is worst case in New Zealand and Aussie to be put on an ECMO machine. X-ray chest, whole lungs clouded out. These are those clouded out X-rays. Alan developed what's known as whiteout pneumonia. This is when the lungs can't be seen by X-ray, so full of infected fluids they are unable to take in any air whatsoever. For weeks on end, Alan's condition changed little, hovering close to death. When it got to three weeks, it was really getting scary then. Just as the family thought things couldn't get any worse, Alan was diagnosed with hairy cell leukaemia. Auckland Hospital notes to the family say... The type of leukaemia Mr Smith has is potentially treatable if that's all he had. However, with his lung failure, Mr Smith cannot survive. Monday the 20th of July. The United States specialist came. Alan's still same. Asked for a meeting at 3pm. Told us they were going to turn off life support. While Auckland Hospital refused to take part in this story, 60 Minutes has obtained Alan Smith's medical files and records of that Monday meeting. This morning we, the CVICU consultants, met and discussed with the ECMO specialist from America, Mr Smith's situation. The group is in unanimous agreement that Mr Smith should be removed from ECMO and be allowed to die. Continuing is only prolonging his inevitable death. My brother just stepped in and he said, no, you haven't tried everything. You've got to try vitamin C intravenously, high doses. And um, they just said, no. The family pleaded with doctors that Alan B. administered high-dose vitamin C, a treatment right outside of mainstream medicine. So what was the doctor's reaction? Oh, they said no because there's no proof of it... Um doing anything or doing anyone any good or my mind was just spinning because they wanted to turn them off and I'm thinking well I hope we can get through this and with that um, Paul and Shane walked in. That's your sons? That, yes, two of our boys. They walked in and um, then uh, you know they really stood their ground. So. <laughs> I, did, wow. I said to him, I said to him, mate, wow, yeah. I said if you lie on that bed for as long as he had without vitamin C you will die too just like he's going to. They Paul and Shane and told me, they said, like, given up, just like when you got a dead cow down, it's, I said, well... They had, they'd given up. Well, I said, them just forced us by them seed in them, so it actually happens. And It'd be fair to say the Smith boys, Paul, Josh and Shane, weren't backwards in coming forward. I says, what have you got to lose, mate? You give me one good reason what you guys have got to lose by trying it. I says, because it's not fair that we, all of us, should go on living our lives with the thought in the back of our minds, you know, if only we'd pushed and tried harder, would it have saved them? They were all about to find out if they'd pushed hard enough. The next day, Tuesday, Auckland Hospital arranged another family meeting. All of intensive care unit medical staff have met again. We are all in agreement that vitamin C will be of no benefit. We all agree Mr Smith will not survive. However, one member feels slightly uneasy that we should wait a little longer before taking Mr Smith off ECMO. It's therefore reasonable to wait until Friday. If Mr Smith has shown no improvement by then, he will be taken off ECMO. In the meantime, given the family's strong beliefs about vitamin C, we are willing to give this over the next two days. So. Tuesday night, he got his first dose of 25 grams um, through the IV, and Wednesday morning, he got another 25 grams. The Wednesday afternoon, they did a CT scan on his chest, and that's when they found the air, the air pockets in his lungs, whereas the x-rays had showed just complete white. So, Alan's x-rays before high-dose intravenous vitamin C, so full of infected fluid the lungs can't be seen. 
This X-ray taken after two days of high-dose vitamin C treatment. The lungs dramatically improved and readily visible. By D-Day, the Friday when Alan Smith was destined to die, when the ECMO life support was to be withdrawn, turned out to be the day Alan Smith was destined to, well, maybe, survive. Mr Smith is stable but still critical. He has improved over the last couple of days. Turning Mr Smith prone has probably made the biggest difference. His chest x-ray is better. They didn't agree or believe that the vitamin C turned him around because... What did they think turned him around? Coincidentally, at the same time as he started getting his vitamin C, they proned him, which was turning him over onto his, onto his stomach. So that's, that's their argument on that's why he got better. So, yeah, be my question yeah. to that is, why didn't you try that before even suggesting to turn the machine off? <laughs> so less than a week after the high-dose vitamin C was started, Alan had improved to the point that he could be taken off ECMO life support. Sunday 26th July. Got taken off ECMO this morning today, hooray. Seems funny seeing him breathing again. He is taking a few of his breaths on his own. Then, just as the family felt they could breathe a bit easy themselves, Alan's health started to dive. They would find the vitamin C had been stopped. This time, a different consultant was there, and he was just so adamant against it. He, uh, he sat back in his chair, and rolled his eyes and crossed his arms and looked at the ceiling and said, no, nah, not putting him back on it. No, nah, no. Nah. Did he make you feel like a bit of an idiot? He did, and it's the first time I ever want to hit someone. <laughs> I got quite serious with, with that doctor. How serious? Um, the meeting was stopped, put it that way. <laughs> Three days later, the vitamin C was restarted, but only very low doses of one gram twice a day. So we've got them all, all in one mob, not two mobs. Now, while these King Country brothers certainly don't claim to be medical experts, they say the mucking about with the vitamin C was reflected by the changes in their father's health. And they say you'd have to be a bit thick not to see what was going on. So he was on 100 grams per day, improving rapidly, very rapidly. And then he went downhill rapidly when they stopped it, cold turkey. When he got put back on vitamin C after that heated meeting, it was at a very low dose. And once again, he started recovering, but it was a slow recovery. They expected to have him transferred to Waikato in less than a week. It took a lot longer. By early August, still critical and still in an induced coma, but by now breathing on a ventilator, Alan was airlifted closer to home to intensive care at Waikato Hospital, who, like Auckland Hospital, wouldn't be interviewed. It was here the Smith family found they had another scrap on their hands. A doctor comes on and stops it. <laughs> and um, Stops the vitamin C? Stops the vitamin C. And, and he says, what? And I said, you know, why? And he said, well, this stuff has come down with him and we don't know what it is. So... Um, here we go again, another fight. This time they brought in the heavyweights. Wellington Public Law Specialist May Chen warned Waikato Hospital. The decision to discontinue the high-dose intravenous vitamin C treatment without consulting with Allen's family is in breach of right 7 of the Health and Disability Commissioner's Code. Of there was even a threat, wasn't there, it, that you would go to the High Court? Yes, we would. Well, this is someone's life we're dealing with, not just anything, you know. Once he's dead, he's dead. You can't get him back. And um, we weren't going to let that happen. So they agreed to give him a couple of grams of vitamin C a day. Yeah. And you wanted him to be on, like, 50 grams a day. That's right. Yeah. So they kind of said, yes, we'll do it, but didn't really do it anyway. No, that's right. 
slowly recovered and it wasn't until um, we got some oral lipospheric vitamin C into him and that's when he once again recovered really fast. After a total of nine weeks in a coma, Alan eventually was woken, which is when Sonia began administering vitamin C to Alan herself using a special high-dose oral form known as lipospheric. The next step was meant to be months of rehabilitation. Yeah, I was taking six grams of that a day of the lipospheric, and of course, when I had to go to rehab again to learn to walk, um, I was told I'd be there for three months. Well, in three months, I did not like the sound of that. But I walked out of that hospital in one day under 14 days. And even the doctors were absolutely disbelieved that I could come right so quick. Alan was back on the farm recuperating when his neighbour John came down the road calling out to him. He says to me, hey, Smitty. You owe me $15. I said, what do I owe you $15 for, John? He said, I went and got me f suit dry cleaned for your funeral, and you bugger, you've come back. Get him behind. Alan Smith's comeback is being talked about around the world, described as little short of miraculous. Alan himself says he's living proof the establishment should be taking high-dose vitamin C seriously, and sooner rather than later. And just a short flight away, his launch in Tauranga. You know, Alan, that there will be many health professionals who say that it is not scientifically possible that your recovery is because of having high doses of intravenous vitamin C. Well, they can say what they like, really, because basically I am alive. I was supposed to be dead. They wanted to turn me off, and um, here I am, I'm alive. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> Just a note, Alan Smith no longer shows any signs of having leukaemia. I've beaten the system, as to speak, and, um, you know, if my family had let them turn me off, I would be dead. Not a good day to be dead today. Not a good day to be dead today. There's obviously a fish out there somewhere with my name on it. We're going to catch it. <laughs>